chocolate. 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 From Dame Cacao, I'm Max Gandy, and this is Chocolate on the Road, the show where we explore hot topics surrounding cacao and chocolate cultures around the world. So let's hit the road. The Philippines is a massive country with over a hundred million people. Seven thousand islands. Of the yeah, Philippines more than around. Yeah, yeah. seven thousand two hundred, I guess. Thanks, Val. Since the whole country is made up of islands, even though there's a capital city, Manila, there are additional cities of great importance. There would be three major hubs. That would be Manila for Luzon, Cebu for the Visayas region, and then Davao City. For Mindanao. This is Ken. My name's Kenneth Reyes Lau. And Ken and I actually met up in Davao City, one of those major Philippine hubs. Because within the Philippines, Davao was actually nicknamed Cacao City, so named for the fact that its region of Mindanao currently produces about 80% of the country's cacao. But this is shifting rapidly, in a way which millions of farmers are hoping will be net positive for the country. The Philippines has traditionally relied heavily upon agriculture, yet in recent decades they've had to import cacao just to meet domestic demand, which again many people are hoping to change in the next few years, including Ken and Val, who will enter the story a little bit later. Ken and his wife, Sheila, who was sick while I did this interview, started a company back in 2016. This company is honestly a huge part of why I wanted to tell this story of Filipino cacao. Because it's a fantastically long one, with priests and ships and, surprisingly, little chocolate. So, where are you two from? And how did you get to Davao? Uh, We're originally from Manila. Uh, our families are based in Manila, and uh, we, when we got married in 2016, we decided to move out of Manila because uh, the, of the lifestyle. Uh, it was very stressful being in the city, uh, heavy traffic, and uh, rising cost of living. So we decided to move to Davao in 2016 and pursue something different. We have almost like a decade of uh, IT experience between me and my wife. So going into farming and agriculture was like a big step. And it seems to have been a step in the right direction. When I started the research for this story, Ken and Sheila's business, Cacao Culture Farms, immediately came to mind. If you search around for Filipino cacao on the internet, There's not much information out there, at least in English. But I knew there was a lot of it growing. Because up until a few decades ago, the Philippines was Asia's top cacao producer. In fact, it was one of the first places cacao was cultivated outside of the Americas. Yet I couldn't find much of anything on it. Enter the youth. As discussed in episode one of this show, Young people around the world are finding common ground. We want real, healthy food, locally sourced when possible. In the Philippines, chocolate has that potential. And like many other young people these days, Ken and Sheila recognized that. So coming from IT, how did you first learn about and connect with this more sharing culture of cacao in the Philippines? Um... I think because Davao region has like uh, is producing around eighty to ninety percent of the whole cacao production of the Philippines, there are a lot of uh, I would say seasoned veterans in the industry here. So uh, linking up with them would be fairly easy. You just ask around, and then. How we got in touch with the organization, we trained under uh, one of the trainings that was given by a group called SIDAMI, which is Cacao Industry Development Association of Mindanao. Mm -hmm. And one of their advocacies is to be able to teach uh, 
proper uh, cacao farming techniques and new technologies that can be adopted. Uh, and that's when we fell in love with the idea of growing our own chocolates. Before 2016, we were in the city. We don't know anything about agriculture. We didn't even know that we could grow our own chocolate in the country. To be honest, I kn- uh, most people don't. Why yeah, would mo- you? Yeah, most people don't. So, so when we saw that, and then we saw how uh, the beans were processed, it was very interesting for us since we do like chocolates. And then I think I I told my wife, "What's the worst thing that could happen? We'll end up with a lot of chocolates." That we'd probably eat ourselves if no one's gonna buy it. Yeah. That's an adorably naive statement. <laughs> but I understand. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. <laughs> if you know anything about chocolate making, you know exactly why Ken and I were laughing at his naivete. And if you don't know about chocolate making, go check out episode 5 of this podcast. Spoiler alert, chocolate does not grow on trees. Cacao does. And it takes a lot of work to transform that into chocolate and related products. But Filipinos have had a lot of time to figure this out. Can you offer any background on how cacao came to the Philippines in the first place? Cacao uh, is not native to the Philippines. It came in via the the Mexican trade between Manila and Mexico during the Spanish colonization time of the Philippines, maybe in the 1600s. Yeah, so it's called the Manila Galleon trade. They trade the spices and other products from Manila to Mexico. And one of the plants that was brought here was cacao. And... Historically, I think it was uh, the friars or the priests that was tasked to, you know, take care of fields of cacao. And they had access to the chocolate or the beans. So what style of cultivation was happening when it was first brought over in the late 1600s? I think it's already planted in vast fields because Mm. churches have access to a lot of land Mm. during that time Mm. so it was planted and then they had access to beans and then they could make their own chocolate drink and Mm. during that time it was very uh, hierarchical in terms of certain social classes would have have access to chocolate and they are supposed to ship I would say the beans back maybe to Mexico or to Spain but uh, they ended up also using it here. So what are the historic issues Filipino farmers have run into with cacao farming and being able to make a profit from it or being interested in it? I think there was a time in the cacao industry where it was uh, exporting a lot of their beans to big companies like Mars Chocolate. And during those times, also, the land are consolidated under certain companies or certain big families, acres upon acres of land. And then they could plant all the cacao that they want. So when the in the 90s, uh, one of the bigger struggles of the cacao industry was the drop in uh, cacao price globally and also the agrarian reform by the government by giving away the farmlands to the smaller farmers. So you have these big companies who had plantations of cacao now have to give land to to different farmers, smallholder farmers. Mm. And those smallholder farmers might have a different idea how they would manage their own farm. So maybe quality drop or they change their crops from cacao to maybe something different like bananas, pineapple, I don't know. As Ken said, much of the corporate land was claimed by the government and then redistributed to landless people. But those individual families with land weren't affected by that policy, including the family of Ernesto Pantua, 
Ernesto invested in land in the Mindanao region after World War II, when the Philippines won their independence. I sat down with his son, Ernesto Pantua Jr., better known as Tito Jun, at their plantation several hours southeast of Davao City. So when did your dad plant the cacao? Or did you cacao, plant the yeah. cacao? No, my father. Hmm. That's why, during those times, the only variety of cacao in the Philippines were the Criollos. Hmm. Yeah. It was uh, actually the legacy of the Spaniards to the Filipinos. Hmm. And uh, fortunately, my father came from Laguna. And there are already a lot of Batangueños and uh, Tagalogs already here in this place. And they, all, they have already planted uh, uh, cacao. Hmm. But uh, what is so significant in my mind was then, my father was already uh, wrapping the cacao with, uh, really? with plastic bags. Yeah. Back in, this was this in the 60s? In the 60s. So this was, cacao was one of the first crops he planted? Yeah, 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 yeah. When he mentions wrapping the cacao, Tito Jun is referring to the practice of wrapping each individual cacao pod in a plastic bag. This lets the fruit ripen without insects pouring into it or birds or other small animals getting into it. And it's now pretty common practice around the Philippines. Tito Jun took over the farm after graduating from college, so he's seen many stages in the cacao industry's development, from his childhood really. This includes a very important shift that took place in the 1980s. So Ken was telling me earlier that there was uh, a time in like the 90s when they brought in different varieties of cacao. Yes. Are all of the yes. trees here still criollo? Not all, not all of the trees. Because what happened actually was, uh, we have established, uh, I think the cacao then was about one third of the total land area. Because not all of the the areas are planted, only about one-third. And when uh, the hybrids was introduced, of course, uh, my father was really amazed and was really wowed over by the, by the performance of the hybrids. But fortunately, he did not cut the Criollos, he let it stay. And when we started to replant or to expand our plantation, we got uh, not the seedlings, the grafted seedlings, but the seeds from the hybrids. Mm. But, you know, it's cross-pollinated already uh. because it fits in the same area. When we expanded, we got only the seeds from the farm. We have a UF-18, but a very few. I think about uh, 300 seedlings were planted, mm -hmm. a UF-18. Yeah. And is that the hybrid? Yeah, that's the hybrid. That's the hybrid. And then those 300 have just like mixed? Mixed. It's already mixed with the other. So uh, generally, basically, most, about 90% of the plants now here in Kaplon would be a mix of uh, the hybrids then in the Criollos. Mm. Yeah. The introduction of a hybrid cacao varietal was a very important time in the Philippine cacao industry. Until that time, basically all of the country's cacao was of a varietal called Criollo. It has a very mild chocolate flavor and little bitterness, even if it's not fermented, but it doesn't yield much fruit. The hybrids, however, yielded remarkably more fruit, even if the flavor was more robust and bitter. Tableya, a traditional way of drinking cacao in the Philippines, is extremely popular. So this was and is the main way cacao is consumed domestically, not in the form of chocolate. And in a big way, the introduction of these hybrids changed the flavor of that tablea. And the hybrids didn't arrive on their own either. They came from Mars. So you started off making that tablea to sell in the 1980s, but when did you start making the other Chocolates. products, like the nibs and the bars? Ah, okay. So this is what get uh, our uh, chocolate story very interesting was the introduction of the technology from March chocolate, mm -hmm. especially that drying, the elevated drying, because then we were drying our dried beans on the cement floors mm -hmm. because this was the tennis court then of my father. Yeah, and we would dry the beans uh, 
uh, not on the cement floors, but on a bamboo tray. Then after fermentation, it would be fortunate if uh, it's not in a rainy season, but during rainy season after fermentation, when you dry them and it's, uh, it's raining, you have to stock them up. Mm. And if you stock them, the trays up, fermentation would continue. Mm. And that's why we were surprised then why why the taste of Batabli varies. varies. Sometimes it's very nice, sometimes it's not. Because, yeah. of course, the fermentation was the factor. I was really surprised when, uh, when my niece, Estella, mm -hmm. uh, was telling me that they can manipulate the, the flavor profile of a bean from fermentation. Before, it was the rare Filipino farmer who fermented their cacao at all. But with this new varietal, the flavor was such that it had to be fermented to achieve any kind of chocolatey flavor. So the Mars Corporation began educating farmers on how to ferment their cacao, bringing its own set of issues. And decades later, most Filipino farmers still don't ferment their cacao. But many people are now working to change that. And fast. Among them is Alberto. I'm the president of the Cacao Industry Development Association of Mindanao and uh, the chairperson of the Philippine Cacao Council. Val has been working with farmers across the Philippines to get them to add more value to their cacao. And how did you start working in the cacao industry? Uh, in 2010, uh, the uh, USDA funded projects under the CDI VOCA. The, the like city that. of... ECDI VOCA. It's a, a U.S.-based NGO okay. funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Okay. Before, it, it was funded by the uh, U.S. aid. Then in 20, 2008, I think, uh, it was co it's the Department of, U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's funded as one. CDS. ACDI. It's so ACDI VOCA. Oh. Yeah, it's an international U.S.-based cooperative, something like that. And they're st they're still here now, mm. but uh, they don't do anymore. They don't uh, provide funds for cacao, but for coffee. So in 2010, there was a consultative consultative meeting called by this uh, group, ECDI Evoca, uh, informing about the opportunity for the cacao and chocolate industry. So after this this consultation workshop with this uh, group from the U.S., a group of individuals uh, organized a. Uh, what we have now, the Sidami, and uh, one of the basic, really primary purposes of this uh, organization is to promote the cacao, promote production, and as well as, of course, the value adding of cacao, and uh, also help uh, farmers and how to grow cacao and develop their cacao farm. We also provided some inputs like the cacao seedlings and uh, some fertilizers, some uh, implements, uh, farm farming tools. It's a, a holistic approach because we know that uh, to be able to be sustainable, you really have to diversify the farm. So that's part of our advocacy in Sidami that the farmers should not focus in, on one uh, crop. Later on, we teach them how to value add. So we have this fermentation, we have this table and chocolate making. For the last uh, eight years, we were able to get a partnership from first the CDI Boca. It was really CDI Boca who started this uh, cacao industry in Davao. So we owe a lot from them because they were the one who pushes us to the limit. So Sidami, led by Val, has partnered with numerous NGOs and the government to really train farmers for the modern cacao market. But not everybody has been interested in this education. How do you choose which farmers? Well, uh, we, we started with the baseline survey, survey. So the survey will focus on the lowest, you know, um, the marginalized of these uh, mm. farmers. Let's say we saw farmers that their income is below five, a family, 5,000 pesos per month. So these are the priorities. So, of course, not all farmers can avail of that. So we're, fo we're, we're prioritizing this, those farmers who have been, you know, anguishing for this, <laughs> you know, yeah, for income. Do those farmers usually have very few crops or just low-value crops? What no, it's different. Situation? Let's say... One one uh, beneficiaries beneficiaries we have with the in the Davao Oriental they're focused more of coconuts because this uh, province here is just a monocrop of coconut. 
So we choose them because we want to introduce to them to diversify. So to introduce cacao, to introduce banana, to introduce even livestock and uh, vegetables. So that's part of the training for them. So the idea is to choose among these farmers who are willing. So the, the requirement, the, the, the criteria is you must be very marginalized, poor farmers. Second is you're willing to learn more and you, you're willing to also plant other crops other than what uh, your, your, the, the useful crops that you plant. So it's like that. So then after that, there's a sort of uh, selection process. So maybe if we target 1,000 farmers, we'll just call up more than 1,000. Mm -hmm. Then we conduct uh, initial need analysis with the farmers. There's their need. So we conduct another orientation. So from among, let's say, 2,000 that we called up, We'll just choose the 1,000, so things like that. The yeah. neediest and best suited. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, because there are a lot of farmers also that you know that they will not also improve because they have, they have this culture already that they're already satisfied with what they are doing right now. So we just focus on those farmers who are interested. But of course, it's not a 100% guarantee that even these uh, selected farmers will also succeed. No? So the success rate is something like 80%. So have you seen any cultural trends affecting what farmers decide to plant? Or is it very much like, this is what we've always planted, so this is what we continue to plant? Uh, it's a good thing now because uh, some farmers have also, you know, uh, followed what we uh, taught them. So let's say uh, we will plant this kind of cacao. There. So maybe there are still some uh, old farmers it's still doing some cultural traditional things that ah we'll just do this one. Let's say thirty percent of farmers. So in fact, that's one of the frustrations that I have now because for the last eight years or more, we have been teaching farm farmers to to do this system like this one. But you know, it's not an overnight really solution to change the mentality of farmers. Until now, you, we're even telling farmers not to dry their cacao beans on the streets in the roads. They're still doing it now because it's it's a very for them it's very convenient, you see. And we are always telling farmers that you really have to ferment your cacao. But until now, I think even more than fifty percent of farmers are not uh, is not uh, doing fermentation. You see, there these are because it's quick, you know. When you do fermentation, you have to extend the uh, the of the, the days where you can sell your products. And the but, time that you put it. Yeah, the time. Because, uh, yeah, see, it, there's a uh, sort of delay of your money, things like that. So, And farmers want an uh, instant quick uh, cash. Mm -hmm. So that's why the practice right now is there are some consolidators who so will buy the the wet beans, the white beans, and it's the consolidators who will do the fermentation. The post-harvest processing. The post-harvest process, yeah. yeah. But, of course, uh, it would be on the losing side of the farmers because they lost some you know potential income from the you know the fermented dried beans but you know they don't care about that what they want is just instant money if they have the white beans now you give me money then that's it how are your and sheila's experiences growing up in manila different from that of the farmers here whom you've been able to connect with because you're now cacao farmers yourselves. Yeah. So your job titles are the same, but how have your own personal experiences leading up to now been different? I think in terms of being exposed to more technology like uh, e-commerce, uh, social media, we capitalize on that advantage. Uh, right now, I would say in terms of social media and uh, e-commerce we are one of the uh, more equipped so if you consider all cacao farmers in the Philippines I would say we might have a slight advantage because of our more experience. accessible yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so in terms of that that would allow us to have access to certain markets that might not be accessible to them right so the most of the products that we produce, we still sell online, and most of the customers that we get are from Manila still. 
So, mm-hmm. interestingly, we need to ship all these uh, products back to Manila. And demand from Manila and the northern region of Luzon is high. That level of demand even travels. This is Emma. She works in Cacao City, which is a chocolate-centric gift shop in Davao City. Would you say your experience growing up in Davao City with cacao is like another fruit, but it's where tablea comes from, knowing sort of how chocolate is made or how tablea is prepared? Is that pretty typical? No, not for me. Just recently, the, I, I know that chocolate came from the tablea because all I know, tablea is just for hot chocolate and for champorado. That's really? the chocolate porridge. It's made with like rice and tablea. Yeah, rice. Is it sweet? You, you can taper the sweetness actually because all the tableas are unsweetened, especially if you're, you, you're the one who's making it. And yeah. all of the tableas here are unsweetened. Do you think that the tablea culture here in Davao is different from in Manila where they don't grow? In yes, cacao? I think. I think because uh, many of our market niche here in Cacao City is mostly uh, domestic tourists from the zone. And so when, actually when we got um, a tourist, when we offered them the cacao fruit, that's the first time that they saw a cacao fruit. And that's the first time also that they ate And these are fruit. domestic tourists? <laughs> yeah. Like people know mango and durian. Yes. Mango, durian, mangosteen, lanzones, rambutan. Coffee, chili. Because you cannot see in the market that uh, market fruit, cacao pad, has been sold to the market. So even like even in countries where they grow cacao, a lot of people don't think about it. Yes. And you grew up with cacao trees in your backyard, yeah. but you still didn't really, or your front yard. Yes. You still didn't really know how chocolate is made. Mm-hmm. And Ken says, I would have thought that since cacao came uh, into Asia through the Philippines, through that connection with Mexico, that Philippines would be in a position now to be one of the like top producing countries of uh, cacao. But now I think we just we barely even touch like one percent. This statistic is set to change really soon. A story we'll dig into in part two. But it's worth noting that the first cacao to be grown on the Philippines was actually grown on Luzon, near Manila. So just like Ken and Sheila, cacao migrated from Manila to Davao and then back sometimes. As Val noted, there's still cacao grown near Manila and even more of it is planted each day. But this resurgence in the interest of cacao has to do with a number of factors. A lot of it has to do with some pioneers that are able to do their own chocolate, like Malagos, uh, bringing their chocolates to like uh, abroad or uh, Europe, having entered competitions, and then they won certain competitions. So that activity spurred interest again in terms of planting, farming, producing your own chocolate. So it wasn't more of farming to be able to sell the beans outside, maybe farming to be able to produce your own brand. So it isn't just producing more and more high-quality cacao, but increasing that cacao's value. It's not just small farmers, but a big movement across the islands. As I alluded to, the government has even stepped in. But traditionally, increasing the value of Philippine cacao meant producing tabalea, which can be limiting in creativity. So some people are working to introduce real chocolate to the Philippine market, challenging the sugar-laden bars on supermarket shelves. So what has Filipino public consumption of cacao been in recent years? We have been traditionally consuming cacao as a beverage and then using uh, it as chocolate. But I think uh, we had, is it 70s or 80s? There were some Filipino chocolate brands that lost some steam and didn't survive. But there, there were already 
uh, chocolate brands in the Philippines mm-hmm. that was more mass production, mass produced. Mm-hmm. We also use cacao in other desserts. What else? Now, I think there's more experimental style in terms of doing your own chocolate. You're adding flavors like durian. But this is in the just in the last maybe five, six years mm-hmm. that we've seen this. And, uh, and I think in the near future, there would be a lot more chocolate brands that would be trying out. Because it's a de- democratization of the information. You could see different chocolate makers online. You could see how they do it, how what ingredients that they use. Mm-hmm. And then that would inspire local makers to maybe use local ingredients as well. The evolution of Filipino cacao and chocolate is complex and ongoing. But real ingredients sourced locally is definitely the current market demand. And Ken and Sheila's social free information approach to it is a good representation of where the market is going. In fact, Ken and Sheila are a good representation of their market. Is that a common choice for millennials to be moving out of the city? I think there's a more conscious decision to put steps into your life to try to move away from the city. Uh, mm-hmm. Some I, I would see some friends move outside of Metro Manila, but mm-hmm. still within the vicinity, I think ours is more of a drastic move to move to Mindanao. Because mm-hmm. in Manila, you, there's out like certain cities that are already like provincial or outskirts cities that would still be just maybe two hours away from Manila by a car. So you could you could see that there are movement outside of Metro Manila. There's this growing uh, sense also of moving back to the provinces. From Mexico via the Spanish and then from elsewhere via Mars. Cacao has a long history in the Philippines. In the next episode, we'll be exploring how some chocolate makers are working for farmers, while some farmers are working for themselves. Coming soon on the road. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chocolate on the Road. I really hope you'll tune in for part two. If you liked it, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes and share it in any way you see fit. Your support really means a lot. An especially huge thank you to Ken and Sheila for being my tour guides for five whole days while I was staying in Davao City. And another huge thank you to Emma, Val, and Tito June for taking the time to talk with me. To learn more about our guests, check out the show notes of this episode at the link in the description or on my website at damecacao.com. That's D-A-M-E-C-A-C-A-O dot C-O-M. Have a wonderful day, and I hope you'll join me next time we go on the road. Mm-hmm.